here in the United States. Sammy came to the United States back in 1975 when he was 17 years old. Came to the United States to get an education. He did get one and became a professor of computer science. He got his master's, PhD, and then started working back in 1986 at the University of South Florida where he received many awards for excellence in teachings. So the knowledge he had acquired in college, he in turn gave it to a lot of students who became good, productive, and successful citizens of this country. Sami himself became a very successful professor. Got married, had five children, and very much his life could not be any better except there was one problem. And that problem was he was Palestinian and he refused just to enjoy the good life like a lot of other people do. They don't want anything to interfere with their good living. Well, Sammy did not look at it that way. Even though he was successful, having accomplished the American dream of getting a good education, have a good supportive family, excellent job as a professor but he was also a Palestinian activist. He did not like what was going on in Palestine and he did not like what was going on in the United States when it came to telling the Palestinian story. So he decided that he wants to tell the Palestinian story and he began educating people and started many foundations and organizations to basically tell the Palestinian story to the American public. He also was a civic leader. He was also involved and as a matter of fact he was uh, campaigning at one time for George Bush and uh, there are some pictures of him with George Bush so he was not just a man who wanted to sit at home and do nothing. On the contrary, he was very active 
And because of that, ladies and gentlemen, because Sammy, as Newsweek magazine, have labeled him as the premier civil rights activist in the country, because of his, of his efforts in repealing the secret evidence law that was enacted under President Clinton, and uh, Sammy was very instrumental in getting the uh, H.R. 2121, which is a bill that made it out of committee and had 130 co-sponsors due to his efforts, and he was termed the premier civil rights activist in the United States. But then Sammy was getting to be annoying to some people, especially on the Israeli side and APAC, especially in the Jewish lobby, who could not have a Palestinian who started to speak and, ex and spread what is going on in Palestine and exposing the Israeli atrocities against the Palestinian people. They did not like that. See, when it's somebody who made it that big and made it, he became an icon to a lot of people and they had to take him down. They charged him with so many, so many nonsense. They had spied on him, recorded their phone calls for nine years, even eight years before. They recorded phone conversations with his family, with his children talking to their friends, personal phone calls, even when they were ordering pizza. Those phone calls were recorded for eight years before they came one day in 2003 and arrested him, and he is in prison as we speak. Now, he did have his day in court, and the jury have found him not guilty on a lot of the charges that were against him, even though the system, the judicial system, that supposedly has in mind or has in mind justice for all, apparently it failed, as it has failed before. It failed Sammy. Sammy thought he had the protection and he had the freedom to speak his mind and defend and champion the Palestinian cause not knowing that even the system that he believed in and the Constitution of the United States that he believed in and raising his children to believe in, it failed him. It did not offer him the protection. We are supposed to be in a country that the Constitution should offer protection to the citizens of the Republic. But the People's Republic of America is not a republic and the Constitution does not provide protection to people who needs it. Sammy is on a hunger strike now as he sits in prison even after he was acquitted on a lot of the charges against him and the jury deadlocked on other charges but now he sits in prison as he enters his 45th day of hunger strike his health is failing. And this is the story of Sami and Ariane. And I'm honored tonight to have his wife Nahla with us to tell us more about what is going on in Sami's life and in their lives. Welcome to the program, Nahla. Thank you. Thanks a lot for inviting me and for this nice introduction. In, in, introduction, I'm sorry. <laughs> introduction uh, uh, and accurate one. Very few people can get our story right, but you did it. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I guess, Nahla, I, I probably did it because I understand uh, I'm about the same age as Sammy, and my story is similar to his. 
I came over here when I was 18 years old and uh, got an education and I'm very much following the footsteps of your husband which I am honored to do so and uh, uh, in a way I'm expecting that knock in the middle of the night uh, because to tell you the truth I just don't believe that the Constitution is enough to protect people who just wanted to speak the truth. Um, Nahla, tell me how is Sammy now? I know he enters his 45th day in, uh, of hunger strike. How is he doing? Well, uh, he talked to me about 20 minutes ago and uh, his voice sounded very weak. But he's still on the hunger strike. Uh, they haven't started for feeding him yet. I don't know what they're waiting for. I, to tell you the truth, I want them to do it, you know, but uh, so far they haven't done that at the prison. And he's in a 24 hour lockdown, and, um, you know, it's a torturous life, you know. You know he doesn't see anyone but uh, the nurse, and that's it. So tell me, let, let's kind of refresh our um, viewers' memory. We, we've talked about uh, Sammy before uh, while the yeah. trial was going on, but tell us exactly what, why Sammy is in jail and how did it happen? Well, it happened uh, when he was arrested in 2003. They came to our home 5 o'clock in the morning and uh, they, they scared us because they were pounding on the door. It wasn't even uh, morning yet, you know, it was very dark and we were sleeping when they woke us up and when I opened the door they saw him inside with a gun in my face, that's the first thing I saw, you know, one of them held his gun uh, in a way. They went inside uh, my apartment uh, to the bedroom and they took Sammy and uh, that was the beginning of of his detention. For two years he was uh, in solitary confinement and, uh, you know, trying to prepare for his trial. And he was put in the federal penitentiary about an hour and a half away from here, from Tampa. That was even in the pre-trial time. And that's very critical for any defendant, you know, he, any defendant deserves to be near the evidence room, near his lawyers, his family, but Sammy was uh, taken far away from us during that time, and he was put in the shoe, and the shoe is the special housing unit, which is horrible, horrible. And uh, the prison people said to him that uh, we are not uh, equipped to deal with pre-trial detainees because Sammy asked for uh, some material, for even pencils, they gave him an inch long pencil to write uh, his motions with because he started defending himself, uh, rep you know, representing himself at the beginning. So it was a very, very tormenting time. You know, so and uh, what, after what the trial, it started I mean... in June 2005 and lasted till December. Sammy was acquitted on eight charges. He had to sign a deal with the government to plead guilty to one of the remaining charges. And uh, when we thought, you know, we were done with everything and that Sammy would be out this April, April 13th, as a matter of fact, the government is tried to prolong his imprisonment by dragging him to testify before grand juries. And this is a game that the government plays with a lot of people, we found out. Taking, uh, you know, people to testify before grand juries. If those people testify, they will be the following day accused of perjury. If they do not testify, they will be put in jail for contempt of court. I went to Norway, and our lawyer went with us, and she tried to explain to people there what it means to be held in contempt. They couldn't understand it. Only in America you have this law, you know, to put people in jail for refusing to testify. Okay. So, so this is the situation. My husband is in jail now for refusing to testify. And uh, unfortunately, as soon as he was held contempt, in contempt, uh, the sentence that he had to serve was frozen. So now he's wasting his time. Every day that passes will not be counted for the prison term that he has to finish.
Okay. So, so I mean, April 13th, the day that he was supposed to be free, will never come. You know, it's gonna be postponed, but not for. Uh, now, uh, Nahla, just just for the benefit of yeah. our viewers, tell tell us what was your husband doing? I mean, what what his activities? Tell me about his activities. What was he doing? Okay, I'm sorry, I, I can barely hear you. I don't know why if it's from my phone. Okay. Uh, can Can you hear me now? Let me try another phone. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Tell me about your husband's activities. Of what was yeah. he doing? Uh, what what kind of uh, I mean why what is his activities what did he do? Well, uh, the first thing let me remember now because <laughs> it's been some time. But uh, you know, all the time when Sunny came here, he was very young. He wanted to you know that's what he learned in America. That America is the land where you can talk and. Uh, you know, uh, hold uh, also conferences, uh, events like that, and nobody will uh, will put you in jail for doing that. So the Intifada, the first uprising for the Palestinians, started in '87, and we were proud of the resistance of uh, our fellow Palestinians because it was, uh, you know, relatively non-violent. They were just holding some uh, pebbles or stones, you know. So. Uh, the Palestinian uprising after uh, 35 years of, you know, occupation in Gaza and the West Bank, of course, that was uh, an event that was very important. And we as Palestinians in America wanted to talk about this and inform our fellow Americans about it. Uh, so we had conferences. We talked about uh, the Intifada, the uprising, and also about other issues that are important. Like, what is our role as Muslims living in America? Our role is to be good citizens and to inform people about what's happening in the East and to try to, you know, make the gap between East and West smaller and smaller. We are, after all, members of the same family, human family. So after holding conferences concerning the Antifada, we thought of uh, establishing a... Uh, you know, a research center that would invite scholars from the Arab countries, Muslim countries, bring them here to talk to scholars from different American universities. So, you know, again, establish a dialogue, and all these are nonviolent activities, and, you know, activities that will help Muslims and Christians understand each other better. We did not believe in the clash of civilizations, but we believed in dialogue of civilizations and cooperation of civilizations. And that's what my husband tried to promote. And uh, our research center was excellent, and everything we did was, you know, public, and you had an excellent journal, political journal, that uh, good scholars wrote articles for. So, uh, you know, of course, the Zionists, they didn't like that. They wanted to shut down these research centers and also to silence my husband. And unfortunately, they succeeded because the media attack on us was horrible. You know, even now, today, there was an article in the Tampa Tribune against my husband. So this attack is intended and was intended that time to dehumanize my husband and that's the the most vicious thing in in the whole saga here because we went through a process of dehumanization for a long long time when sammy was arrested the government thought people wouldn't care since you know he was dehumanized this way but thank God, the American people, a lot of them, you know, even the jury, look at what the jury did, you know. We thought that the jury would believe the government, but they did not, and they acquitted my husband on most of the charges, and the majority wanted to acquit him on the rest of the charges. But the judge stopped all the deliberations of the jury, unfortunately. Now, let's, let's talk about the trial for a second. Yeah. Um, were you allowed to show, because I know they brought in a hundred people to testify against Sammy from Israel. Were you allowed to bring in all the, your evidence and all your witnesses? Were you allowed to bring in all that? No, no, no. It's like, 
the judge, you know, shut our mouths up completely. He forbade us from talking about the Palestinian cause. He allowed the government to, to only talk about the Israeli side uh, of, of the story, to bring Israeli witnesses to talk about what the Palestinians did to them, but they, he didn't allow us to talk about, you know, our suffering, the occupation of our land, the, in, how many Palestinians were killed, how people lived there as prisoners in their own land, you know. All this, the jury didn't hear our uh, point of view at all. We didn't hear our story because the judge forbade us from doing that. And the judge also, I found out that uh, the conspiracy law that the government used against us allowed the government to use any kind of thing as evidence. You know, for example, there were websites my husband never looked at, and none of the defendants looked at. And those websites, uh, you know, the material from those websites became evidence against my husband. One time a defendant had a dream against, uh, I mean, of my husband without telling my husband, you know, he, he dreamt of him, but he told a friend, and that dream became evidence against my husband. Wow. So this trial, people should really study what happened during our trial, because it was like not... You know, this world, maybe a different world, the crazy world, you know, the, where the defendant is not allowed to testify, uh, I mean, or to present his point of view, the evidence, unless he is on the witness stand. That's the only way. And that's when you lose a lot. If you sit on the witness stand, the burden is not on the government anymore to prove your guilt, but it is on you to prove your innocence. But now, uh, the conspiracy me. law is made exactly for the government to win the cases and to, to you know, to use all kinds of methods to uh, to put the defendant in jail forever. Now, tell that's me why about it was your... a, a real miracle that we really, uh, you know. We yeah. were uh, Nala, tell me about your your yeah. your personal life. You have five children, and uh, as I understand, most of them are uh, they're educated. They're going to universities. Tell me about your personal uh, your your family. Tell me about your family. Well, uh, Sammy, uh, again, you know, one of the activities that Sammy did was to establish an Islamic school here a private uh, school for the community, for even uh, non-Muslim kids. But he really wanted to focus on the education of uh, the kids here, all of them. And uh, because he was a professor and, uh, you know, as an educator, he cares a lot about education. Education for the Palestinians is the real weapon. Always we say that, you know, our, the way we defend ourselves is through education. So here, uh, my husband, of course, took care of my kids, and he really, uh, you know, educated them and, and tried to put them in the best universities. And that brought uh, contempt from the judge. The judge was so, uh, uh, you know, contempt, contempt, whatever you call it, because uh, our kids were good students. As if this, you know, the Palestinians should not uh, be you know, good students should not have a good life, should not uh, be successful, you know. We always, it's like, I'm sorry, but this is the racist view of the judge. I think, you know, to him that, you know, we should stay weak and like, uh, you know, uneducated, uncivilized, that's what he wants us uh, to be. But my children, uh, throughout all this ordeal, they continue to study, and that's very, very hard. For example, today, you know, I was talking to one of my kids, and she said, Mom, I cannot concentrate on my studies because of my father. My father is suffering. How can I study? How can I think of, of anything but his health, you know? So uh, my children, and that's why also, you know, the, uh, the word of support that we received from our fellow Americans kept us resisting and resisting because here we felt that the government and the media, as I said, tried to really destroy us emotionally and psychologically and, and thank God we stayed strong to, you know, fight back and to defend 
their father and to defend our, you know, our cause. So they, they are strong believers in their father's uh, just cause, and thank God they support him, you know, okay. a lot. Uh, tell me and about Sammy. Where, where is Sammy at now? He's in Butner, North Carolina, at a Florida Medical uh, uh, Federal Medical Center there. Okay, you, you don't have like, uh, how, if somebody wants to uh, send letters of support to Sammy, uh, how, how could they do that? Uh, well, we have all the information on freesammyalarian.com. That's the website for my husband, and uh, you will find a lot of information there. You will find the address, and uh, okay. I hope that you will write letters because... Today, for example, he received some letters, and he was happy to receive those letters. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead and put that on the screen, uh, freesammyalarian.com. Let's go ahead and put it on the screen so our viewers can uh, write to him. Now, to tell me what can the average American citizen do to help your case because definitely definitely an injustice have taken place and if anyone knows anything about the constitution of the republic there are two votes that that makes that republic one of them is the jury system that we use and uh, yeah. Sammy was acquitted so the people voted that Sammy was not uh, he was not a criminal and so they acquitted him of these charges. What can the average American uh, citizen do to help Sammy? Uh, well, you know, they can do a lot. They can write letters to the Attorney General asking him to keep his promise uh, to us. He promised us to free my husband, to, you know, deport him. That's fine. But he has to keep his part of the deal and uh, to stop this grand jury nonsense, uh, to stop uh, sending subpoenas to my husband to testify. This is very important. The Attorney General should hear from uh, my fellow Americans and the attorney and also our uh, congressional representatives should hear from us. You okay. know, they have Let to know that they have a role to play here because they are the branch of the government that uh, examines what the executive branch does. You okay. know, and the executive branch here is abusing its power, and we have to stop that. Uh, I agree with so, you. I mean, abusing yeah. power has been going on, but people didn't yeah. know about it. But now I think people should do something. You know, uh, I, I talked last week about a uh, case in uh, New Mexico where a U.S. attorney was fired because he did not bring up uh, a, a case to prosecution as fast as some of the Republican congressmen wanted him to do because there was a benefit for them in that case. So apparently and definitely uh, there is interference in the justice system and these judges are bending to this, to, to this political pressure. But let me give some information out there what you can do to yeah. help Sammy. Uh, you can write to the uh, Honorable Judge Gerald Lee, United States District Court for the Eastern District of Virginia, and uh, you can write to Alberto Gonzalez, as Nahla have mentioned, and uh, you can send them email on for the uh, Department of Justice. You can send it to ask doj at us doj.gov and you can find all this information on Sammy's website and you can also write to your senators and your congressmen because this is an injustice that is taking place ladies and gentlemen what makes this country different than Germany during Hitler is you are supposedly still in power and you can voice your opinion Apparently, it, uh, I don't know how long this is going to be going on, but as, as far as, as of right now, you can freely speak, and I think you need to write your congressmen and your senators and tell them that Sammy Alarian 
uh, there was a great injustice that had taken place in his case, and we need to lift that injustice because the jury have acquitted him, and he's still sitting in uh, in prison. And as I mentioned before, he has entered. It, it's today now like 44 or 45 days uh, in uh, in his hunger strike. I think it's 44 days. 44 days today? Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, regardless if it's 44 days or 45 right. days. Right. Uh, it was really time. It started so fast, unfortunately. But thank you so much. And I want to also mention something very important, uh, which is about the National Council of Churches. Tammy, as I said, believed in, you know, always building bridges between the Muslim community and the Christian community. And he invested in that uh, for a long time before he was arrested. So uh, we have a lot of ministers who are very close to my husband. They love him. And those ministers asked uh, the National Council of Churches to support our cause, and they are supporting it, thank God. They sent yesterday an email to about 120,000 ministers asking them to send letters and uh, their congregations to send letters to the Attorney General. Today we had about 3,000 letters were sent to Attorney General Gonzalez. You see, so I uh, hope that more and more people will write letters and emails to Mr. Gonzalez. You see, Nahla, your husband did not commit any crime, but your husband was very successful in piercing the ceiling that was put on Palestinians, Muslims, and Arabs in this country where they cannot tell their story to the American public and your husband has accomplished that and that's why he had to go. That's why they had to do what they had done uh, to him. Now let me ask you something. Uh, the, the research center and all the activities that you were involved with is that still on? Is anyone carrying on? Or what happened to all these uh, foundations and organizations that your husband had founded? No, unfortunately, everything was closed down a long time ago. For example, our center, uh, you know, we closed it in, in 96, 1996. And, and that's why this whole prosecution is so ridiculous. They were talking, uh, you know, in, in court about things that happened in 94 and 93 and 92. What is that? They brought videotapes of lectures my husband gave in 91, you know. So we were, live, you know, living our past again. And there were so many people that we wanted, for example, to bring as witnesses, but they died, you know, the old people, for example. So it was so crazy, you know, to go and just look at everything you did 15 years ago and try to remember what happened that time. It was, I'm telling you, an impossible case, so unfair in every part of it. You now, know? let, let so me ask all you... all the centers we established, except for the school, thank God, the school is still open, but, uh, you know, they, they have a different board of directors, and uh, they have a different name for the school and all that, which is fine. Uh, well, you know, what, what you just said brings me to a very important point. How, I know what effect Sammy's imprisonment has on you personally and your family, but what effect did his imprisonment have on the Palestinian cause that he had championed for so long? That's another thing, you know, we don't see uh, conferences about the Palestinian cause anymore, unfortunately. And that's at a time when the Palestinian people uh, are suffering even more and more with the sanctions and the starvation that they are going through, unfortunately. You know, and... Uh, so apparently the people been, you know, who were around Sami and yeah. they were championing these causes, apparently they all went into their own separate ways. So they did not just take Sami out, but actually they took a lot of people because now probably people are afraid, saying, well, look what happened to Sami. I'm not going to do it. Do you see that? Yeah. They instilled fear uh, in the hearts of uh, so many uh, Muslim Americans. And uh, I think, you know, this uh, atmosphere of suspicion, of fear, intimidation, will not to bring, uh, you know, a healthy relationship between the government and its citizens here. 
because after all we are citizens of this country and we we deserve to be treated uh, with respect with trust especially that we didn't really do anything wrong here, you know, show me any a criminal event that um, a Muslim did, nothing. Even September 11th and this horrible uh, tragedy was executed by people who came and did not even mix with the Muslim community. So the Muslim com community is patriotic. They care about America. They didn't do anything to hurt or harm the people here. And they have rights like everyone else. And instead of, uh, you know, winning their hearts and minds, the government is doing everything to alienate them, to make them uh, isolated and uh, fearful, and this is not good. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm going to ask you a question, and I need an honest and a straightforward answer, uh, Nehla. Are you satisfied with the support and help you are getting from the Palestinian and the Muslim community in the United States? Of course, everybody knows <laughs> that I'm not satisfied, but the problem is that this is what they can offer now. They are scared, and thank God the larger uh, community understands that. And uh, when I go to the church, you know, the people there tell me it's all right. We know that they are scared, and, uh, you know, they may uh, not give you the support, uh, you, you know, you need from them. But we are here for you, and... Our love and compassion will always be with you. So maybe this is the time for the Christian uh, community to give us this, uh, you know, what we need to find in the Muslim community. This is the time because they feel that they are not under uh, the same threat, the same, you know, intimidation by the government. So they can give more. They gave us protection. They gave us, as I said, love and support. And uh, I appreciate that. And. The Muslim community, little by little, will, God willing, you know, come out and uh, get rid of this fear. But well, it is not easy. I, it's not I easy. Think Their homes have been, you know, most of them, they were visited by the FBI, and even in their businesses, they were intimidated. And uh, what, what the Muslim community went through is vicious and horrible, and uh, I hope this will end. Well, I think and I hope it will end because Sammy spent his life uh, basically sticking his neck out for Islam and for the Palestinian cause and for Muslim cause. And I think now Muslims and Palestinians need to go out on a limb to uh, try to help him. And I don't think fear needs to be there. You know, uh, I understand you receiving a lot of love and support, but love and support alone will not make things work and will not change things. I think we need more uh, active or proactive uh, communities in the United States on the Muslim, the Arab, and the Palestinian communities. They need to be more active. You know, this message of support alone will not work anymore, and it does not work uh, anymore. Um, uh, Nahla, I, uh, do you, we only have a few minutes left, and uh, uh, would you like to close with a statement? Just tell me anything you want to talk about, anything, just anything you want to talk about. Well, uh, I, I want to thank you for uh, drawing the attention to my husband's case. It's very important, as you said, for people to know that Sammy wasn't only a Palestinian. Sammy is a human being who cares about the rights of people everywhere uh, on this earth. And uh, that's why, as uh, you know, you also mentioned that he was successful because Sammy cared about the society here, cared about you know, the betterment of the society, we cared about establishing uh, bridges between Muslims and the uh, larger Christian community. And I hope that my fellow Muslims who are listening will do the same. Do not isolate yourselves. Be part of the society and be active and try to, go, to get to know people because even today, for example, when I was uh, at a gas station to, you know, trying to fill my, ga my car with some gas, there was this guy I never knew who said to me, I support you, Mrs. Alarian, I, I know about your husband's case. So there are so many people there in the society who love us and, and care about us, even though we don't know them. 
So let's get to know them and let them know us, you know, better and better because that's the only way we will uh, defeat those people who are racist and who want us to be isolated completely. So, and to put uh, my husband and others in jail. So they how are long, exploiting the ignorance of the people. How long are you looking at Sammy being in jail now? He has been in jail for four years and maybe God forbid, maybe three more years or maybe forever. We don't know. So you have no idea what the future holds for you? No, nothing, nothing. Uh, when is he supposed to be... The only thing I feel is that, you know, uh, there is a God and uh, he will take care of us. And he's a God of justice and he will not allow this injustice to continue forever. Have you asked for Sammy to be moved closer to the family in Florida? No, we are helpless here because they want him near the court where he is supposed to, to go to and testify. So that's why they moved him from Virginia, where he was staying at a county jail, to to North Carolina, because that's the closest medical center owned by the Bureau of Prisons. Uh, that is, you know, the closest to Virginia, where the court is, where he's supposed to go and testify. Okay. So no. that's why they moved him there. Okay, Nahla, I just wanted to say thank you for coming on the program. It was an honor to have you on the program, and thank I you wish me. you and Sammy the best of luck. And we will follow up on uh, what happens with him, and hopefully your Please, yeah. nightmare will be Keep over soon. Keep us in your prayers, all of you, and uh, you know, try to help us, and always remember us. Thank you. Thank you, Nahla. Thanks, that was Nahla Al-Aryan, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the wife of Sammy Al-Aryan. Uh, who is luck we have introduced and his wife has been talking to us for the last uh, 40 minutes about him and we need to understand that his case is a unique case in a way and it's a shame that it took place in the United States this is a man who was helping the United States this is a man who believed in the American dream this is a man who uh, who is raising his children to be productive citizens and he has sent them to the best schools that there is out there but unfortunately unfortunately um, this is what happens to productive people who thought they were under the production, uh, the, the protection of the uh, Constitution. But we do have another prisoner there that there are a lot of congressmen, senators, and a lot of people interfering on his behalf, want him out of jail, and that prisoner is Jonathan Pollard. Jonathan Pollard is a Jewish American who worked for the Navy and had given the Israelis a room, a whole room full of documents. He just copied every document and has hurt the United States big time. People are asking, congressmen, senators are asking for his release. They have been trying for years and years and years. Clinton refused. Bush the father refused. But there are talks out there that Bush, the son, will do it. This will be a treason, ladies and gentlemen, if he lets this guy out. Jonathan Pollard had hurt, damaged the country beyond repair by giving a whole room full of documents to the Israelis. That's why he is in prison for life. He's lucky that he is in America. In other countries, traitors are taken out into the streets and hanged. But then we have a successful man, a family man, a man who believed in America and thought that he had the protection of the Constitution. And his crime, his only crime, is he loved his motherland, he loved his people, and wanted to get their story out. He wanted to get the story of the Palestinians who are being killed and slaughtered every day. He wanted to stop 
the Holocaust that is in progress. We talked about Ernest Zundel in the first hour of that Holocaust. Now we have no excuse because we have a Holocaust that is taking place as we speak and we're not doing anything to stop it. That's his crime. His crime is he wanted to show you what Israel is doing in Palestine. He wanted to show you the wall that Israel is building. He wanted to show you all the crimes that is being committed against the Palestinian people and the slaughter of the Palestinian children. That's what he wanted to get out to the people. But unfortunately, unfortunately, he is in prison because, just because, he wanted to do that. He wanted to show what is happening. And at the same time, he also wanted to get, even before 9-11 even took place, he wanted to get all religions together. He wanted Christians and Muslims to start a dialogue, and they did. He wanted Christians and Muslims and Jews to start a dialogue, and they did. That's who Sami al Aryan is, ladies and gentlemen. And that's his main and only crime, is that he basically talked and used the freedom of speech that was given as a privilege to American citizens even though it's a natural right and it should be the right for everyone every human being in this world but in the United States it was a privilege and that privilege was taken away just because a judge thought that Sammy should not have that privilege when will they be taking away your privileges that you thought were your natural rights that will never be taken away from you. When will you wake up and see what is going on in this country? Eight United States U.S. attorneys were fired because politically somebody thought they were not on the same line with the political norms whatever that might be and they were fired one of them I mentioned earlier is David Iglesias out of New Mexico he was fired because two Republican congressmen wanted him to bring charges as fast as he could or as fast as they wanted him to bring it and he refused because he was not ready that's his call so he refused. He lost his job. That is interference in this same United States that we think, justice for all, congressmen interfere. Political powers interfere in the judicial system. Of course, you're sitting there and saying, what's new? What's new, ladies and gentlemen, is this country built as a republic on two things. There are two votes. That's what makes it a republic. One of them is the jury system. That's the second vote. And the first vote, of course, is when you vote for your political representative. But the second and most important, by the way, because you on the jury have more power than anyone in the United States. You have the power to even say that the law is unconstitutional, that the law is wrong and unfair, and you can change the law. That's how powerful you are. That power, ladies and gentlemen, is coming from the citizenship that you have as an American. Now, some people don't like that power. And I am sure that Samuel Ariane's case was politically motivated from the start until 
to finish, and we don't know what that finish is going to be. I am sure that the powers to be have interfered with the judges. They have interfered with the system. Why would the prosecution bring 100 citizens from Israel to testify against Samuel Aryan, who had nothing to do with any of the happenings that were happening back in Palestine? Why they were not allowed to present their evidence? But you know what? You prevailed. As a citizen, you prevailed. Because no matter what the jury tried to do in Sammy's case, what, what, the, what the system tried to do in Sammy's case, you, the jury, were not influenced. And they could not influence your decision. And you found Samuel Ariane not guilty of the charges that were thrown against him. But even with that, the judge felt that he needs to bend to pressures were put on him politically and that's why Sammy is still in jail. We have a lot of traitors in this country ladies and gentlemen. One of them was just found guilty on four of the five charges even though even though you see when the system comes down to the jury you know what you're doing because no one can influence you. No one can interfere with you. But they are interfering with judges. The media have tried to make Scooter Libby look like the perfect all-American boy. If you don't know who Scooter Libby is, he was the chief staff under Vice President Cheney. He ran Vice President Cheney's office. And he was responsible for the leaks, and he was responsible for um, obstruction of justice. That's what he was found guilty on four counts of the five counts that he was charged with. But let's see how many years will he be spending in jail. Is he arrested now? Even though the media tried to protect him, and even though all these talk show hosts like Sean Hannity and Rush Limbaugh they painted him with a beautiful picture of the patriot American the man is a Zionist Jew who basically thought of Israel first regardless of what happens to America he's not the only one in government Paul Wolfowitz was there under Rumsfeld Douglas Fife was there under Rumsfeld and many, many other Zionists who are controlling, some people like to say influencing, the government and the policy in the United States. When are we going to wake up and see what's happening in the country? When are we going to see this relationship with Israel, the political entity that is somehow they were able to lie to you and tell you that this is our ally allies don't spy on each other allies don't take allies to wars just for their own benefit because that's exactly what happened when we went to war and destroyed the country of Iraq which had nothing to do with 9-11 which had nothing to do with weapons of mass destruction but all of these lies were concocted in Prime Minister Sharon's office that was linked directly to the office of special plans at our own Pentagon that was ran by Douglas Fife who is an Israeli his mother is an Israeli citizen. His father fought in the Bitar Brigade in the Israeli army in 1948. When he left the administration of George Bush, the father, he was kicked out of that administration. He was a junior 
on the junior level. He went to Israel and had his business and his law practice there. Then he came back to the United States. That's why we went to war against Iraq. That's why we went there and destroyed the country. Killed 655,000 people so we can have an Iraq that is weak and divided for Israel. That's why. And a debate needs to take place in this country on our relationship with Israel. It is costly and it is wrong. Somehow they were able to lie to you and link Israel to the Bible. And that's the tragedy. That is the tragedy. We need a debate in this country about how good Israel is. We will see you, ladies and gentlemen, next week. Just wanted to say good night and go do the right thing. We'll see you. This week in history.